Okay. Hi, Rolf. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Oh, doing great. Thank you. Thank you for you. inviting me to the show. I really appreciate being oh. able to talk about science and beyond. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. You are a professor at McGill University Emeritus, right? Yes, yes. I I spent 33 years at McGill University doing research in plant morphology on the development and evolution of plant form. And then after I retired, I turned to more general topics. Does emeritus mean retired in Latin? Is that <laughs> what is the definition of that word actually? Oh, emeritus is a special honor. Uh, not everyone who retires uh, becomes uh, emeritus. Uh, so, uh, like in my case, I mean, I, I'm rather well known internationally in my field, and for that reason, I became an emeritus. I mean, I've been doing science for my whole life, and. Uh, and I also have been interested in what's beyond science because uh, many people think that uh, science can do everything for us and uh, will eventually reveal the complete truth, the truth with a capital T. But uh, this is not possible for various reasons. Science can tell us at best uh, aspects of the truth, but not the full truth. And when this is recognized, then there is, of course, room for also philosophy, for the arts and for spirituality. Science and spirituality have seemed to be at odds with each other uh, over the last centuries. And it just seems to be getting worse as we as a human race advance more technologically. And I'm not convinced that science has the answer to everything because science seems to be evolving as we as a race evolve. But spirituality has remained constant for centuries. Would you agree with that? Well, um, spirituality, of course, can mean many different things. But uh, if uh, spirituality is more like religion, that means involves uh, some doctrine, then of course uh, that doctrine uh, can uh, can uh, conflict with science, like we've had it in Christianity, right? For example, with regard to evolution, so there was a conflict there. Right. In in other religions like Buddhism, there is much less of a conflict because Buddhism emphasizes uh, impermanence, change, and so evolution fitted there fitted in very well. But um, in general, I would say spirituality, uh, as I see it, uh, goes really beyond doctrines, beyond worlds. When people have a spiritual experience, they say very often, well, this experience cannot be captured in words. Uh, so, uh, so that means it's really beyond language, between beyond what can be expressed through language and therefore beyond any doctrine because doctrines are usually expressed through language. Uh, so if one understands spirituality in, in this sense as, as going beyond uh, language, uh, spiritual experience beyond language, then there is really no conflict anymore because uh, science uses language and mathematics, a form of language. And so everything that's uh, uh, concluded or in science is, is in terms of language. And if spirituality is, is, is beyond language, then of course, it's beyond science and, 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 and there's no more conflict. That's one, one thing that I emphasize very much in my book, that, that spirituality as, as a spiritual experience um, can really go beyond uh, science because it goes beyond language. Okay, so your book is called Science and Beyond. And is the basic premise of your book the idea that science should not be relied on solely as man's guide, the, the human race's guide, where spirituality needs to be a component in, in our lives as well? Yes, very much so, because uh, science uh, is limited. And uh, 
for that reason, uh, we cannot, uh, it cannot give us the total picture. It can give us only a limited aspect of reality and spirituality. Also, the arts and philosophy can give us another aspect. Uh, I would think maybe even a broader, wider aspect of of, uh, of, of reality because it, it goes beyond what can be represented through language. Um, science and spirituality, science and religion, like we talked about with evolution, seems to be at conflict with each other. Why do you suppose yes. that is? Well, uh, because um, religion religions often have a doctrine that is expressed through language and uh, and if especially if that doctrine like in Christianity is taken literally then of course it it, it contradicts uh, science for example evolution right. and then there's the conflict uh, so um, I think the the problem there is uh, is is really with with the doctrines uh, uh, I, I found it very interesting, the Dalai Lama, who is very interesting, I dedicated my book to him and to some others. Uh, the, the, the Dalai Lama, who is very interested in, in science, uh, in fact has annual meetings with scientists, he said if, if in, Buddhist, in Buddhism, in the Buddhist doctrine, uh, there's anything that contradicts that is not in agreement with science, then we have to change the Buddhist doctrine. I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, conclusion. That is a very interesting conclusion. So he's suggesting that Buddhism is flexible. I've never heard anybody say that with regards to Christianity, at least not, <laughs> not too many people. Christianity is pretty much set in stone and you either believe what they tell you or you don't, yeah? Yeah, I think there are exceptions also with regard to Christianity, but the, the common notion is often very rigid, I think, has been very rigid. Maybe there is some, some change occurring, but uh, at least in the past, and it has been pretty rigid, and therefore there has been this conflict. And by the way, I, I find this conflict is stronger in, in the United States than, for example, in, in Europe. Uh, I grew up in Germany and uh, I, I never experienced much uh, emphasis uh, in, in, in the school curriculum or so that, that uh, the religious doctrine, uh, creationism and all this has to be taught. And, and, and I, I, but I became keenly aware of that when I moved to North America, where this seems to be uh, more emphasized and, and then becomes more conflictual. Let me ask you something about the school system in Germany, since you said you grew up there. In, in the United States, we have this concept of the separation of church and state. And as time has gone on, we've done things like gotten rid of prayer in school and gotten rid of teaching Christianity with the exception of teaching it at a university level. But in high school, I think unless you go to a private Christian or Catholic school, they're not teaching it. In Europe, are they teaching religion to children in school? Well, I, I am no longer up to date what it is like now, but when I went to school there, um, yes, religion uh, was taught, but it was not compulsory. So, so I, I was not obliged to, to, to follow the re religion class. Okay, and you went to public school or what the equivalent of public school public. would be? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, all right, well, that's interesting. Was it something about your years working with plant research that inspired you to write this book? Did you have some kind of an epiphany with your plant research? Did something happen? Well, uh, the more I studied plant, plants, the more I, I realized that uh, our common way of uh, thinking about plants is very limited, actually much more limited than, than necessary. For example, the logic we usually use is uh, still Aristotelian logic 
And Aristotelian logic is is based on the so-called laws of thought. There are three of them. The first one is the law of identity. A is A. The second one is the law of uh, non-contradiction. Uh, a cannot something cannot be A and not A. And the third one is the law of the excluded middle. That means something is either this or that. I, so it's either or. So it's really a logic of identity and the logic of either or. And so <laughs> in blank morphology, people very often ask these either or questions when they found something that didn't fit the categories. They still kept asking, well, is it either a stem or a leaf or a root or whatever? But this either or thinking is very deeply ingrained in plant morphology, in biology, I would say, in many sciences and of course in, in everyday uh, life. People also ask very often, um, is something true or false? Is something good or bad? And so on. So we are still very, very much in our culture, very much entrenched in this Aristotelian logic. And also the identity. Uh, there's, I find nowadays especially, so much emphasis on identity. People talk about their identity and so on. But if you, if you look at the world, uh, there is really nothing identical. No object is exactly identical with, with something else. Uh, there's always some difference. And even myself, I'm not identical with what I was, let's say, um, a few months ago or a few years ago. Um, uh, actually, there was this famous uh, um, Greek philosopher uh, Heraclitus who said, you can never step into the same river twice. Why not? Because uh, the next time you step into it, the river is different and, and the person who steps into it is different. So, so uh, this is really, uh, if, if that philosopher would have had more influence on our culture, I think our culture and our science would, would have been remarkably different. But uh, the philosophers that influenced uh, our culture very much where Plato and Aristotle, and they emphasized very much identity and, and either or, although they could see also beyond it, but their followers often got really trapped into in, in, in identity thinking and in either or thinking. So you see, I, this is something I, I learned uh, through just looking at plants that this either or and identity uh, view is not always appropriate. In, in, in some cases, or maybe many cases, it may be appropriate. But if you find something that, that doesn't fit into the categories, let's say something that is somewhat intermediate between a, a stem and a leaf, it doesn't make sense to ask, is it either a stem or a leaf? So this led me to a continuum thinking you know that, that there is a continuum from one to the next, uh, like there is a continuum between black and white. And uh, this continuum thinking is not very, very common. In fact, I find a lot of resistance to that because people are so used to either or that they, they, they just often uh, cannot, cannot see it, things differently. I think that's a very good point in the takeaway either or, because if you take either or and apply it to true spirituality, it doesn't apply. What happened was Christianity and other organized religions somehow adulterated the concept of spirituality. At least I think it did. Yes, yes, because they put too much emphasis on, on either on or. Thing. Yeah. On either or, yes. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, who was very instrumental in the Middle Ages uh, for uh, with regard to religious doctrine, he considered Aristotle the philosopher. And so this either his his either or be, became also <laughs> incorporated into religion. And uh, as you say, uh, that that. That doesn't make uh, too much sense there. And, and people who have spiritual experiences, they can see very clearly that one can go beyond that. Um, yes, that's very true. 
Well, Rolf, unfortunately, we are out of time. We just kind of blew right through this interview very quickly. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. Do you have a website that you want to give out for your book? Or yes, I have website? a special. I have a special website for my book, which is just www.rolfsattler no period in between dot com, and there people find uh, details about my book and also where they can buy it. Um, and also, I should I should add the book is available as a paperback and also as an ebook, and the ebook costs only one dollar. <laughs> How long has the book been out? Uh, it came out last summer. Okay. How's it doing? Is it doing pretty well? I, I had actually many interviews, and uh, so uh, and and the result, the comments about that were very favorable. So, um, but. Um, it seems the interest in it is somewhat limited. I don't know why, because I think uh, nowadays there is so much talk about science. And and uh, what I emphasize very much in my book is um, um, widespread misconceptions about science and how how these misconceptions can have really det detrimental consequences for our health, sanity, and well-being. So, in a in a sense, I find my book is rather timely uh, because uh, of everything that's going on right now. Yeah, I think so too. Well, thanks again for coming on. It was nice meeting you, and best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. Thank you very much.